What's cracking, big dogs? Welcome back to the channel. Welcome back to the HQ. I am Nicholas. I am joined today by Dr. Jesse Morse, and we're going to break down some injuries. Maybe they're current, maybe they're past, maybe they will affect the future. And we're also going to talk about some general strategies concerning injuries because, you know, on the channel, we don't like to just tell you who to draft, who to stay away from. We want to teach you to be better fantasy football players in the long run. Today, we're going to be breaking down the Redskins backfield because we have a lot of moving parts there. We have a lot of injuries between, you know, three or four separate guys that we want to break down and kind of give you the leeway on, on who to draft, who to stay away from, who to target. We're also going to be getting into uh, knee scopes in general, right? We hear a lot about knee scopes. It's a term very frequently thrown around the fantasy football sphere. Uh, we have a couple guys dealing with them already in this offseason. We have, you know, Chris Carson, we have Sonny Michelle, and I'm sure we'll hear a lot about other players eventually going through them throughout the summer. So we want to know more about what exactly that is and how concerned we should be. We're going to jump into a couple elite wide receivers in terms of AJ Green and Julio and the foot problems that they're currently dealing with, as well as some other general strategies to take away um, while you're in season concerning injuries overall. I know you guys, um, I get comments on basically every video asking, when is Dr. Jesse Morris coming back? When is he coming back? When is he coming back? Uh, I'm pretty excited to announce that he will be on the channel weekly in season to talk about um, all the injuries that are taking place throughout football, right? So you guys can kind of know what to expect on a week over week basis with the injured players. So I'm really excited to have you, Dr. Jesse Morris. I know you just finished studying and took your sports medicine exam. I, I don't know <laughs> if I said that right. Last Friday, yeah. you've been studying like crazy, but now it's done. Now it's in the books. How did that go? And uh, welcome back to the channel. Thank you. It went uh, well. Um, this is uh, a very complicated and detailed exam. Um, I studied pretty much 20 to 30 hours a week since November, maybe. Sheesh. Can you give me an idea. Um, My man's is grinding over here. But uh, that's done with. Um, as everything goes well, it'll be 10 years and we'll need to take it for again. So uh, we're good. Uh, now I just get to focus on uh, fantasy football, and then I see patients every once in a while. There you go. You got your priorities in order now. Um, so without further ado, actually, I want to ask the audience members, you kind of uh, heard the show sheet for today. Drop a comment down below which players or you know injury types or something that you would like to hear about in the future, because I'm sure I'll have Dr. Morris back on the channel at some point, maybe in August, maybe multiple times before the season kicks off. So we'll try to get around to answering any of your player or injury type questions. So scroll down below real quick, drop a comment while you're down there, hit that thumbs up button and let's get to it. All right, so we're going to jump right into this Washington Redskins backfield. It's a crowded one. We have, obviously, Darius Geis re-signing Adrian Peterson. We have Chris Thompson, the explosive scat back, and they went out and drafted Bryce Love. Just to give the audience a quick uh, breakdown of these guys, we know that Darius Geis is a sophomore running back who <coughs> tore his ACL last preseason. And uh, I was someone that was really excited about him as a talented prospect coming in. And that ACL tear um, happened in the summer, eventually got pushed back due to some kind of infection, which meant the rehab process got pushed back three months, ended up pulling a hamstring, you know, within the last couple of weeks or something during the rehab process. Obviously not good news. Chris Thompson is a guy that I was kind of excited to get back on the train this year because you can get him in best ball drafts in like the 15th, 16th round. And we've seen him at one point or another be an explosive NFL playmaker. But the more I started researching for this video, the more I was concerned about him because his injuries date back all the way to college. I'm talking about like broken vertebrae. We're talking about torn shoulder labrums and then coming into the NFL and also missing time with the same injuries, right? Back injuries, torn shoulder labrums. A couple of years ago during his like breakout season, he, tore, uh, he broke his, um, his leg in some, in, in some place. So he's not someone that's been able to stay healthy. And I know you just did the Chris Thompson injury write up for the draft guide. And after I saw that, I was like, yeah, that confirmed basically everything, <laughs> everything that I had researched. Huge, 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 huge inj injury concerns for Chris Thompson. They draft Bryce Love, who's coming off an ACL tear. So I don't think he's really going to be involved in 2019. They re-signed AP, who, you know, is a guy that at this point in his career, I don't think he signs just for the money, right? He thinks he's getting on the field if he's getting mm -hmm. a contract from a team. So 
break down all of these moving parts as you wish and uh, tell us, you know, guys that you are concerned about, guys that you might completely take off your draft board, or is there anyone that you're even targeting in this backfield? So I'll start off with this. I want nothing to do with the Redskins this year. Too many moving parts. Um, they uh, haven't really been able to put anything together after Cousins left. Um, their wide receivers are mediocre at best. Uh, let's break down the backfield a little bit, though. So we have AP, we have – or AD, I don't know. I, I always get confused with the hell we're supposed to call them. We know what you're talking um, we got Geis, we have Thompson, the Perrine, and some other guys are there. And then we got Love. So we know who Adrian Peterson is. He's been doing it forever. I'm still amazed that he can do what he can do, despite all the wear and tear he's had. He is going to be the feature back. The reason that's why they brought him back that he wouldn't go back just to be a third, you know, a third down or you know, bench warmer. Obviously, not for that money and not in, the, in general. Mm -hmm. So why? It all had to do with Geis. So Geis was supposed to be their new Adrian Peterson. But unfortunately, he suffered pretty significant injuries and then had setbacks to said injuries. So who is Geis? Well, well Geis, is, 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 he reminds me of almost like Zeke in, in his running style. He doesn't have the receiving abilities that, that, that Zeke does. But coming out of LSU, the problem is, you know, he, they, they called his initial injury last year a sprained MCL, which is that ligament uh, on the inside of your knee uh, that uh, kind of protects your knee from collapsing inward. Well, unfortunately, it wasn't just an MCL. It was an ACL. So the ACL, as we know, is just kind of a, a no-brainer. You have to repair it for a, a, someone of this caliber running back. So that's straightforward. And, and for the most part, these guys do pretty well. Adrian Peterson had one many moons ago. Mm -hmm. But here's the problem. Geis had an infection that required not oral antibiotics, but IV antibiotics. So that means that if you've already put a graft in, there's a good chance it's probably not going to hold. If you hadn't put the graft in yet, you can't put the graft in until you finish the antibiotics and he's completely cleared the infection. So that's seven weeks of daily infusions of IV antibiotics. That's a long time. Boy. Then um, that, that further complicates the ACL. So we're, we're pushing back his timeline at least seven weeks, probably 10, 12, maybe 14, maybe even longer. When it's all said and done, guys had four surgeries. That, that's a lot of surgeries on one knee for one issue. Ideally, you go in, you, you take care of the ACL, and then you, that's one surgery. But four? I mean, so there's a, we don't even know if the integrity of this graph is good. I mean, do, do we? I, you hope it is, but, I mean, has he really, really stressed it yet? I don't know. So then comes back, ramping up in the offseason, and then he suffers a hamstring strain. We know hamstrings are very common. Hamstring is a protector of the ACL. Hamstrings... Uh, if they're not healed properly, you will have a situation like Leonard Fournette or Dalvin Cook where they come back too soon, they re-injure it, and then they're out for another four or five weeks. I want nothing to do with Geis this year because of his violent running style, because of his recent injury, because of his ACL injury, because of what you're going to have to pay for him to get him. Okay. Long term, now different story. Yeah, I still like him in Dynasty. I still think he's a, a very good prospect, but the thought of drafting him in a redraft seems like a, a waste of a pick to me if you're not getting him in like 12, 13, 14th round at this point. I almost don't even know if it's worth the roster spot. But when we look at a guy like Chris Thompson, now, if at any point you want to get all of the in-depth write-ups for all of these players, Dr. Jesse Morse um, is literally writing out, you know, pieces for every player that has some sort of injury concern going into this year, as well as an injury rating for them. You can get that at the fantasy doctors.com. If you just want the injury reports, um, it's also included in the big dogs draft guide, which you can get on big dogs Now in there, I believe Chris Thompson was rated an eight out of 10 or an eight and a half out of 10. Um, why? Right uh, eight. Yeah. Eight out of 10, which is obviously a very high re-injury risk yeah. for 2019. He's just the guy that's dealt with, so many injuries, again, dating back to college. Now, if you're, you know, looking at a player in – is he just completely on your do-not-draft list? Are you not even wasting a spot? 
So given his draft capital, I like Chris Thompson. Okay, I'll start off with that. He's a fun player. I like him. He, he helped me win a league uh, maybe two, three years ago. I, I don't even remember what it was by now. At this point, every year feels like the same year. Yeah. <laughs> but I like him. He, he's a good scat back. He can catch. I mean, he's good. But the problem is he's missed six games each of the past year. So two years in a row, he's missed six games. That's uh, – when you're talking about it, that's most of the season, at least for fantasy perspective. Um, then I went – I, I kind of went back and dug in his history. This guy's had some crazy injuries. He fractured two vertebrae in the middle of his back on a play at FSU. Mm-hmm. He tore his ACL in 2012. Yep. Um, then – he uh, tore his labrum, which isn't overly concerning for a running back, uh, but he missed seven games from that. Uh, then he did okay. He was kind of blah, blah for a couple of years, and then they really used, utilized him. Yeah, um, I, think his, I think his rookie year, he actually retore that same labrum again. So he didn't really get – he only played two games his rookie year. And then, yeah, like you're saying, like two years later, they finally started getting him involved. And then he gets hurt. Yeah, like he was like ten games into the season. Everyone was like, "Holy shit, Chris Thompson is really good. He was a great fantasy." I know exactly what year you're talking about. And then you know he got hurt again, and here we are. Yeah, I mean, sixteen I think was the only year that he played all sixteen games. Yeah. And then and then like seventeen, everybody was super hyped about him, or at least I was. Um, I mean, he was rushing for five point two yards per carry. 350 yards, who's targeted 62 times, which back then was a big deal because not yeah, everybody running through to their running yeah. backs like crazy as they do now. I mean, he had 49 catches for 350 yards and another two TDs. Like, that's a very good flex back. I mean, you're not going to – that's not an RB1 or maybe an RB2 in a deep league. But, you know, but, but now – and then and then the next year he started off like, like fire. I mean, he had 39 catches – 510 yards at 13.1 yards per catch and over the first 10 games. But, hey, he fractured his leg. He broke his fibula, which is that small bone in the outside of your leg that only bears about 85% of the weight of your leg. But, unfortunately, you can't really run without it. That's what OBJ fractured and a bunch of other stuff. Um, so, like, you need that. And, unfortunately, he, I think that cost him, like, six or eight games or whatever it was. Yeah. Um, so, like – that was another. Then, then the next year, I was like, oh, well, yeah, we know he's a beast when, you know, he's dynamic when he's on the field, but can we trust him? And again, he, he missed half, uh, most or a lot of last season with other injuries. So it's like right now he's going in like the uh, last year, he's going in the seventh round, like Will Fuller, Cooper Cup, uh, ACL injuries, go figure, uh, uh, Tevin Campbell or Coleman, you know, those guys. And, and, he, and that's the appropriate place for him. But he missed another eight games with a knee and a, and, a, and a rib. So it's like he's missed 33 games since 2012. That's like – that's two full seasons. Yeah, I mean, you've only been in the league for five, six years, and you're missing that type of time. So, yeah, I mean, I, I'm excited about him only because <clears throat> they've shown – you know, there's a lot of pe- – there's a lot of scat backs that people like. They're like, oh, he's an explosive athlete. But we know when he's on the field, they actually use him in that role, mm-hmm. right? A lot of players look good, you know, in practice or you think they're explosive, but then they're not utilized correctly. This is actually one backfield in which they are. So I like taking Chris Thompson in the 15th, 16th round, the best ball, because you can get him so, so late. And the upside is definitely there when they want to use him. And I think, you know, the situation where we find ourselves at Washington is they have so many heads back there that there's there's no way that they're going to be forced to, to push Chris Thompson into – uh, a voluminous role where it's it's like too much for his body to handle, which is something that I think Loki makes me like him a little bit more. But what about, you know, what about Adrian Peterson? Obviously you don't like Darius Geis um, this year. Chris Thompson is an injury concern and, and Bryce Love tore his ACL. I believe it was like January 1st. Yeah. Late, He's still yeah. like very much in the rehab process. You know, I don't even, uh, he'll probably be popped almost the whole year. Yeah, exactly. So we don't, you know, we don't draft players coming off the ACL, especially mid to the end of the year last year. We want yeah. them two years removed from it. So Bryce Love is, is definitely off your redraft radar. I think Chris Thompson's last year on his contract is this upcoming season. So Bryce Love could be, um, you know, Chris Thompson once he retires. But for this year, are you thinking about Adrian Peterson or are you just like, this is just too much of a fucking mess to even think about? So I think part of the issue with, with um, the Washington is their quarterback situation. Right. I mean, like, I don't really want anything to do with Case Keenum. I mean, Haskins, yeah, but 
I don't know. I mean, That's, yeah. Best case scenario, it's like if if you're taking one of these running backs, you are you're a very optimistic person. You're hoping Dwayne Haskins becomes the quarterback, and you're hoping that Dwayne Haskins is the prospect that people who like him he becomes that guy. You know what I mean? So it's like there's a you're reaching a lot. I think so. People get excited about AP, and I start to see him going in the tenth, eleventh round of best ball, and I'm like, I get the appeal. But he had so many bad games last year, too. And with Chris Thompson back, he's not going to catch any ball. So no. you're, one, just hoping that they don't even give Darius guys the ball. But it's probably going to end up being, like, both of those guys get 8 to 12 carries a game. Chris Thompson gets six targets a game or something like that. And it's just not a backfield. Yeah, so everybody gets a little bit. I mean, it, would I consider drafting Chris Thompson? Yes, in the 13th, 14th, 15th, in a PPR league. He's going to get the majority of the targets. If he gets 60 to 80 targets – that's that's a great pick in, right. in, in, way back there. I mean, you're not adding it on to AP's volume or somebody's volume, which would equal like a Zeke or somebody like a bell cow, like that doesn't exist really anymore. But on his own in a flex or a crazy deep league that you're starting six, eight, you know, super flex league or something like that, I think Chris Thompson is, is justifiably, you know, draftable. And especially if it's only going to cost you a 14th or 13th or 15th round, like that's reasonable. Yeah. Uh, even if he only gives you eight games, I mean, that's that's probably eight pretty productive games. You know yeah. AP's coming off when, when they're throwing the ball or, or, they're, or they're both on the field. Yeah, I'm with you there. Yeah, exactly. If you're going to get him in the 15th, you can get eight, ten games out of him. I'm sure those are going to be probably like six or seven usable games in, in PPR format. So, for the most part, stay away. But maybe at the right value, you'll, you'll take one or two of the pieces there. Let's move on to knee scopes. Let's break this down. Let's let's talk about what exactly knee scopes are, right? Because we hear about them all the time. And, you know, I'm wondering, is it literally just a way to look inside someone's knee? What sort of event, like what would have to happen to a player in order for a knee scope to be, you know, what happens at a doctor's office? Is it just a regular checkup? Like if, uh, if we're from a knee standpoint in which, you know, if it's someone that's just been dealing with knee issues, do they get like, a, you know, once a year they get a knee scope? Because that's kind of what it seems like. I feel like Sony Michelle gets a knee scope every, every six months at this point. So, um, so jump in there. Like tell us a little bit about right. knee scope, how worried we should be, and why the, you, people are even getting them in the first place. So um, I'll, I'll back up and start kind of from the beginning. Okay. Uh, knee scope is a minor, can be major, but predominantly minor uh, arthroscopic procedure where they go in, they usually create two incisions about really small, about a quarter, half an inch big, give or take. Okay. They put a round a pipe or pole in there. One has the camera on it. The other one has instruments that you are, depending on what you need to do, are going to uh, put in there. Uh, this is not invasive. I mean, it's invasive, but it's no big holes. It's not large cuts. Um, they are predominantly used for uh, evaluating meniscal tears. Uh, you can do ACLs with them, um, uh, but uh, some guys end up going traditional because it's just too big or they can't get a good, good angle, good grip. Um, they can go in and remove small things, uh, repair stuff. Um, a knee scope is, uh, they, they do it in the shoulder, they do it in the hip, but the knee is probably the most common by far. They used to be really, really common, um, and, and, but they've backed off. Orthopedic uh, in general have backed off the past 10 or 15 years, predominantly because we realized we need more meniscus than we, than we thought, and, and we were removing it way too quickly, and it was leading to arthritis really quickly, i.e. Uh, Todd Gurley. Right. Um, so if you, come to a, 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 if you come to my office, so I, I work in an orthopedic office in, in, in Florida, and say, all right, I have knee pain, and you are in your 60s or 70s, there's almost a 90, like um, almost impossible for you to get an e scope. It's just not happening. It's just not realistic. You could get one, but it, it, there's other options that are better, safer, or if you're going to replace the knee, you just replace the knee. You don't need an e scope. Knee scopes are tailored for your high level athletes or your younger athletes, whether they're 20 or 40, um, who have a torn meniscus, who, who tear their ACL, who have a, 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 a floating piece of cartilage or something in there that's blocking that needs to be removed. So uh, what is the meniscus? The meniscus is essentially uh, your shock absorbers for your knee. So think of it as like a, a pretty thick piece of, uh, of cartilage that is in between the upper and lower leg bone. And basically its goal is like the shocks for your car. So think of having, you have four shocks on one each for, uh, of your tires. Uh, if you drive around over 
X amount of years, you're going to have wear and tear on those shocks. Well, you can change out those shocks and not a big deal for your car. Well, the problem is we can't change our shocks for our knee. When, when that meniscus starts to wear down, it's more prone to tearing. So the, any, any significant twisting injury can lead to a tear of the meniscus. So think of almost a piece of paper and ripping it. Now you have uh, this, this kind of gap in between those two pieces of paper. And if that piece of paper folds up on itself, now the bone on top is, is able to touch that bone on the bottom because that meniscus isn't there. Well, if it folds back on itself, it, it's not perfect, but it'll be okay. But if it, if it uh, doesn't fold back on itself or it continues to kind of wither and, and, and kind of cause some issues, that's going to cause recurrent swelling. Uh, a lot of pain, and they'll feel uh, the per person will feel like their knee is locked, or it keeps catching or giving way. Like these are all things that can happen. If it's a large piece, the knee will actually get stuck, and you, they won't be able to bend their knee. They won't be able to put weight on their knee, and they usually come in with crutches, or they'll, uh, or or um, if they can bend it, that sometimes a, like a uh, wheelchair. But those are the people that usually have something called a bucket handle. Those are bad tears, and those always have to have a scope. If you tear that meniscus, even a little bit, traditionally, we would send you to rehab. Depending on your age, I might do a cortisone injection to calm things down and kind of decrease the swelling and the pain. And then I'd send you to rehab for a good four to six weeks. And a lot of the times, that calms down. I had one a couple of years ago. It doesn't bother me. I'm going to do squat, uh, squats at the gym today. I'm, I'm fine. I can do parallel or even lower, and it doesn't really bother me overly concerning. But for a high-level athlete, like a running back who's cutting on a dime and running at full speed and getting hit every which way, you need that meniscus to cooperate, and you need to be able to, uh, to, to have that knee move whenever you're asking it to move. And when you have a partially torn meniscus, you, it just doesn't happen. So if you tear that piece of paper and now that piece of, that piece of paper is kind of flapping, um, you need to go in and, and kind of trim out that little piece and then calm things down. That's what Sonny Michelle had earlier last year. Uh, and that's what likely he had again this past year. And uh, Chris Carson, the same thing. Uh, I don't know how large. Um, I don't know where it was, obviously. Um, a lot of the times they're in the back of the knee, which is where they implant into the, uh, into the bone. And the issue with the meniscus in general is that it doesn't have a good blood supply in general. So it doesn't heal well. Uh, the only time it heals well is if you like, tear your ACL and you have a meniscal tear. If they suture it, because you're going to be off your leg for like several months, it will heal pretty much. But most people are not going to do that. So they end up just trimming it out rather than trying to repair it just because it's not realistic to repair it and normal people uh, who aren't going to shut it down. Are they prone to tearing again? Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, and, this is and, why we keep seeing Sonny Michelle yeah. getting over and over again. And, and that's the problem is like you can trim it out, but it's never going to be like it was. You're not replacing it. You're trimming it out. I mean, just go on Google right now and type in meniscal tear uh, arthroscopy and you'll literally pop up a picture of uh, of an arthroscopy of because they take pictures of it and you'll see exactly what it looks like and you're like oh yeah that makes sense like so it every, looks like a piece of rope like just so every floating. time so every time someone gets a knee scope like at minimum they're getting a little piece of that taken mm -hmm. out and it's only usually yes yes okay. so yeah, i mean every once in a while they'll do it just to look but that if you're going to go in you might as well do something Right. Okay. So we have, yeah, Sony Michelle dealing with this multiple times. And obviously the knee is a huge concern coming off of, you know, the injuries that he had in college. Um, and yep. then it, you're right. Like he had the knee scope pretty late into the off season last year, I remember. And that like pushed back his return date. Um, I think he missed the first game or two or yeah, he, yeah, he missed a couple, at least a couple games. Yeah. And then, you know, it, it was something that he dealt with throughout the entire season now, with a guy like Chris Carson, I mean, he's dealt with a lot of injuries. I'm pretty sure, you know, we knew about the knee thing a while ago. Like, Pete Cowell came out and said that he was dealing with a knee injury maybe two months ago. So, I'm, I'm assuming at this point, we're not too worried about it because he's had time to heal. But now it kind of seems like you're saying each time someone would go in there and do a little something, it might get a little worse and a little worse and, and gives it a higher chance of maybe re-injuring it. How close to the season do we need to be worrying about it? Or in general, do we, is it just something that we have to you know, worry about no matter when it happens to the player? <clears throat> so I'm more concerned about the integrity of the ACL than I am about 
than the integrity of the meniscus. I mean, with that being said, the ACL is gonna is prone to fail if you don't fix the meniscus. The meniscus is vital. Like, what is the meniscus for? Any twisting movement, getting in and out of your car, going up and down stairs with that leg, squatting to grab something low from a shelf, um, walking on grass, any uneven surfaces, uh, walking on sand is like the worst friggin' thing you could think of. Um, anything like that. So like, that's everything we do. Like anytime you walk, you're, you're walking off curbs, you're stepping on little rocks that you don't even think about. Well, when that meniscus moves and it sends a lightning bolt down your leg, that's what these guys feel when they have a meniscal tear. So uh, in general, I'm not overly concerned about Sony Michelle or Chris Carson in the short term okay. about their knees from this perspective. And ACL different beast. Uh, Chris Carson has actually had a pretty clean history slate, injury slate. I will say this just to interject. I'm not sure because this is kind of like deep research, but he did – Carson tore his ACL in high school, his senior year of high school. I'm not sure if that changes anything for you or not because that was so long ago, and I'm sure he's way past that. But I don't know if that affects, you know, future arthritis or this knee scope or anything. I, I was not aware of that. Um, but uh, as far uh, – for the past five years that I could find research-wise – the only major injury that I could find that he had, uh, which was almost a freak injury, was when he tore or ended up fracturing or broke his ankle, not last year or the year before in like game three or four or whatever is. Unlike the Achilles or the ACL, and you can read this in my article if, if, if you end up pulling it up, uh, an ankle fracture heals great and you really don't have to worry about it that's why he was able to run for 250 carries in over what 11 1200 yards last year like right. you can do that off of an ankle fracture a year later you can't do that off of an acl or usually you can't yeah um so for in terms of uh, knee scopes in terms of chris carson and sonny michelle and whoever else gets one for a running back in particular a little bit concerning will they have to be smarter about reps will they have to be smarter about wear and tear, ground and pound, taking better care of their legs, yeah. In the long run, will it end up probably shortening their career? Yeah. Okay. But in the short term, not overly concerning unless they happen to just have a massive tear and then they'll be done for the year because it just will be so big that they won't be able to repair it quickly and come back in two, three weeks like some of these guys do. Okay, yeah, because most of the analysis we hear, it's like, okay, they had a knee thing done and that just gets thrown out there left and right. It's like, Oh, Chris Carson's dealing with a knee thing. Some Michelle's dealing with a knee thing. We don't really know the context behind it. So you're saying there's a little bit of, you know, injury risk, a little bit of hesitation built in, but not to the point where you need to be like avoiding them. Cause I see, you know, I mean, Sony Michelle started the off season as like a late third round pick and now I'm getting him in like the sixth round of best ball drafts. And I'm like, listen, yeah. I'm a little nervous about the knee cause he's dealt with it so many times. But if I'm getting him in the sixth or, you know, probably soon to be seventh round because the hype will keep continuing for Damian Harris and this whole knee thing, like you're getting a guy with like 12 rushing touchdown upside and the injury concern is not, I mean, it's definitely there, but it's not as high as most people think. Yeah. So I finished Chris Carson's uh, write up about an hour ago. Okay. His um, risk score is a five out of 10. Not overly good. Sony's is going to be between a five and a six. Okay. I haven't finished his yet, but to give you an idea, like not overly like, like, as I said, Thompson was probably an eight and Fournette's like a nine or a 12. If I could, like, <laughs> like he's so high that I, I wouldn't man. touch him. I don't care if he's in the fifth round. I wouldn't touch him. He just, I, I can't trust him. Gotcha. But every injury requires context, but there's certain ones that you, I know uh, you can do better without, okay. or, you know, not having to really worry about. And, and for these, I'm not overly concerned with them. Okay. I'm interested in hearing uh, whether or not we're overly concerned with these wide receivers that we brought up earlier. Now we have AJ Green, we have Julio, two 30-year-old wide receivers. AJ Green is coming off of a significant foot injury. We have Julio Jones, who I don't really know if we have any context behind the injury. I don't know if it was like, you know, he's sitting out some of um, OTAs with this foot injury, but if that's more of like a ploy to tell them that he's not happy with the contract. This is something that we've heard about Julio Jones for years and years and years now. Um, I'm not really sure if we have much context behind it, but I'm, I'm, I'm interested in knowing what your concerns level are, your concern levels are for Julio Jones. And with AJ Green, I know when you came on my channel earlier, right? Like we, we had talked about how this was a significant injury, much more significant than people had kind of made it out to be. And they're kind of, you know, everything is just like, oh my God, he's such a good value in like the late second, third round. And we were like, hold up a little bit. And it's not like, 
someone, I mean, after the video, he was someone I kind of put on the do not draft list, but you were saying, you know, it's a situation to monitor, right? And if we see him playing really well in the off, in the off season, if we see him planting really significantly um, throughout practice and stuff, then AJ Green will be kind of back on your draft board. This is also mm-hmm. um, I, I had heard somewhere I read a, an article that Antonio Gates had reached out to AJ Green or vice versa. Them two had talked this off season because Antonio Gates dealt with the same injury that AJ Green yep. is dealing with. Um, it was back in like 2008, and he actually suffered it at a later point in the season than A.J. Green did. I believe Green's was in, like, somewhere from week 11 to 12 or something. Gates had it happen to him in the playoffs, and he played the full 16 games the following year. His production dipped. Basically, every statistical category dipped by about, I want to say, like 25% receptions, receiving yards, those kind of things, um, yards per reception. So I would assume that that kind of factored into it. But with A.J. Green, like, what are we looking for at this point? I don't know if you have any more context uh, around the injury. How concerned are you at this point? AJ Green is starting to develop some hype. There's a buzz based on some of the people that I listen and read that the Bengals offense is going to be really potentially really sneaky this year, despite losing their recent uh, rookie tackle for the year. AJ Green, uh, Mixon, Boyd, obviously all play a role in that. Um, what do we know about this A.J. Green injury and has much changed over the past two, three months since we knew about it last time? So he went down in week eight. He uh, ended up uh, kind of coming back, uh, but then he left again in week 13 and ended up pretty much that was the end of his year. Right. So what do we know about it? So this is a turf toe injury. So turf toe is a uh, – think of jamming your finger – now think of that as your big toe. Mm-hmm. The problem with it is it hurts like hell. Um, it is unbelievably hard to run on. And think of walking on it and then trying to think of running on it. Right. Um, and it, it, it just doesn't heal well. I don't see this much in regular practice because it's not very common. Hence the term turf toe because most of the time it happens on turf. Uh, but it's, I mean, it, it doesn't have to, but it usually does. Um, Thankfully, there are ways to treat it. Hence, Gates uh, ended up doing quite well for the rest of his career despite having this. Basically, he's going to have to do a couple different things. He should be pretty much 100% from this or close. But his 100% is probably going to be more like 80% of his former self in terms of the toe anyway. Gotcha. The rest of his body, as far as we know, should be fine. The issue with the toe is that you need it to push off. You need it to jump, to cut. Everything requires your big toe. That's your center of balance, and that's the, it's the thumb of your foot. I mean, it's super important. So if this was your third or second or fourth toe, not overly concerning. The big toe and the little toe are both super important. We'll talk about the little toe in a minute with Julio. So the issue with A.J. Green is that we need to make sure that, A, this is properly healed, and B, that he's able to get out there and using the proper equipment. Most of the time, these guys will put in carbon fiber, like you see in a car, but an insert underneath their big toe uh, in, uh, as, part of a, as part of an insert for a shoe or sole. Okay. And that usually allows them to prevent the hyperextension, which indirectly is how he did it in the first place. Is he prone to doing it again? Yes. Uh, but the fact it was healed is very good. It, obviously, he didn't, it didn't, uh, wasn't surgically healed and treated midseason. So that's why he was prone to getting it again. So he probably had like a grade one, maybe early grade two partial tearing initially. He rehabbed it, um, but he was still prone to getting it because it wasn't fully really healed and he needed to take a month or two off and he didn't have that luxury. Bengals just extended Tyler Boyd. Um, I knew it. it I knew they were going to extend Boyd and not Green. So I, I feel like he's going to do well this year. I feel like he could be a steal in the third round, but he's, there's definitely some concern there. Okay. Yeah. With, with Green, it's like, like a six. Yeah. I, I think you had it. Yeah. It was like a six or six and a half in terms of injury risk this year, which is not, you know, significantly high, but it's definitely still something to monitor. With Green, it's like it, it's a combination of things for me. Kind of like how you said, you know, he, he's going to be 80% of his former elite self or 85, which is still good. But in the third or fourth round, you can find a lot of guys with that type of upside there, right? You know, you're not getting a 1,500-yard, 12-touchdown A.J. Green anymore. 
also like when Gates dealt with it, he was 26 or 27 years old. Breen's already 30. So there's a little bit of age disparity there in terms of the healing process. We don't know what this, like, you know, I, I was really in on this Bengals offense in terms of like having a, a low key, like breakout year with all their skill players. That Jonah Williams injury, it was a major, major concern for me because he was going to kind of anchor that offensive line and really flip things around 180. Now he's out for the year with the shoulder injury. It, it makes me nervous. because We still don't really know what we have from Dalton there. Is he going to play well? Is he the sum of his parts? Like there's a lot of moving questions around there. Obviously, the Bengals care more about extending Tyler Boyd than they do A.J. Green. That should probably tell you something. So with Green, it's like I, I, he doesn't have the ceiling that a lot of people think he does. Even if he stays healthy for, you know, 15, 16 games this year, he might put up, you know, 75 for 1,100 yards and seven touchdowns, which is, you know, by all means, I'm not going to say that's a bust in the third round. But when you have guys that break out every year in that area or you have high upside, like top 10 running backs where you could draft in that area, Marlon Max or Aaron Jones or whatever, Derrick Henry or something, I'd much prefer going with them considering like the injury risk isn't necessarily baked into where you're getting them. So Green is, is still a concern for me, but it's good to hear that as long as he was like kind of properly rested up, maybe the injury concern is not as severe as I had originally uh, thought it to be. So I, I, I'm kind of excited to talk about uh, Quintoris. Actually, for, for people that don't know who Quintoris is, that's uh, Julio Jones's burner name. Yeah, that's his real name. That's his, that's his born name. Yeah. Quintoris Lopez Jones, a.k.a. <laughs> Julio. So I, I, I actually finished his profile this morning. So um, his uh, everything's fresh in my head. Um, Please don't give me bad was, news. No, this kid was a beast, like forever. Yeah. I mean, like. We're talking, he won the 2006 Sash 7 Gatorade track and, fee, uh, track and Field Elite Athlete of the Year in Alabama, the entire state. He was three-sport track and field, basketball, football. He uh, was the number one wide receiver in 08. He ran a 4.39 on a broken foot in the combine. Huh? <laughs> I, like – he like this. I mean, he was second only to AJ Green in the, the uh, like, I think it was 11th, uh, 2011 uh, uh, draft. He was the sixth pick. So, like, so uh, let's take it back. Everybody said, Oh, Julio is injury prone. Who's really injury prone? Well, that's kind of calmed down a little bit. Why? Because he's played, he hasn't missed a game since 2016. Okay. Out of his eight NFL seasons, he's played in 87% of his games. Okay. If you take out, like, I mean, most of those missed games are in the beginning of the year. Like, the last five years, 16 games, 16 games, 14, 16, 15. Yeah. So, like, he broke we always, his foot that one year, and that cost him pretty much the whole year. Or four, yeah, and then outside of that, he's been, he's been on the field. You hear the reports about all these lower body injuries and whatever, but he always plays through it, and at a very yeah. high level, too. So, here, here's the core of um, – I broke it down and I'm like, all right, what is, why is Julio considered injury pro? And it came down to two injuries, two, two body parts. One is the hamstring and two is his right foot. Track athletes are prone to foot injuries because of their overuse and mechanics usually play a role, whether it's their pronation, whether it's the footwear, whether whatever it is, they, they just happen to have a lot more foot issues, unfortunately. But most people, once they're done with college and high school, they don't really run as crazy anymore, so don't really worry about it. Well, Julio still does it. So that's why he's unfortunately still dealing with it. He actually fractured his fifth metatarsal, which is basically the pinky for your foot, back in his senior year at Alabama as I said before, as far as we know, before he went to the combine. Why is this such a big deal? Well, the issue with the fifth metatarsal is that it's broken up, uh, the base, which is towards the heel, is broken up into about this long of an area, is broken up into three parts. The tip is uh, very good blood supply if you fracture it, not over a big deal. The second part, which is called zone two, is a big deal. And the third part is also a big deal. That's that's most of the foot uh, that heals well, but it just it usually requires surgery. Zone two doesn't heal almost in anybody. It, sh it has an awful blood supply. There's a little bit of blood coming from the bottom and a little bit of blood coming from the top, but there's really nothing in between. And, and the bone just doesn't heal if you break it there. Okay. This is namely called the Jones fracture. Go, fig go figure. Um, and 
almost always does this require a screw. Even in like lay people that aren't asking, you, this almost always requires a screw. You can rest it for like eight to 10 weeks and not put weight bearing on it and you might get lucky, but put a screw in it and just call it a day. I had one of these a couple of weeks ago. Greg Olson is also dealing with this injury several times. So to give you an idea, this is a common injury. Uh, I think Sammy Watkins had this once or twice as well. This is just a common injury. If you roll your ankle, the fifth toe will tuck up underneath, and that's how you break it. It happens all the time, and unfortunately, if it fractures in zone two, you're going to have to have a screw in there. That's what he had probably maybe once, if not twice already, and that's why it had continued to bother him. The good news is that I think he's finally over it because he's learned how to take care of himself. That's the only thing I can think of because the, the fracture hasn't changed in terms of becoming less fracture prone, he's being smarter with his reps. He's being smarter with his footwear and his foot placement. Um, he's he, he's not going to training camp uh, and doing all the full reps like like anticipated because of this. Probably um, just being smart about it, and that's why he has been so successful over the past two years because he's been healthy. We know he's a beast. I mean, there's no question. Yeah. So you don't think um, like the reports coming out now are probably not a new thing. It's just this ongoing, you know, managing the reps or anything. Okay. Unless we hear something that says he suffered a re-injury, which I haven't seen. No. I'm not worried about him at all. Okay, great. Yeah, because I know a lot of people are concerned. Obviously, I just drafted him in a dynasty startup because you get Julio real late because he happens to be 30 years old. Yeah. You know, people are like, ah, I don't want him in dynasty. But I'm like, yo, give me like two or three more years of elite Julio, which are probably a likely outcome. I'll take that all yeah. day in dynasty. So. Uh, Good to know Julio Jones is not much of an injury concern. Obviously, monitor reports to see if anything um, further comes from it. I think, you know, they're just – they're arresting him because he's Julio Jones and they understand as a professional sports team what he's going through. They have doctors there that help manage those reps, and they obviously want to extend him. I hope they get that contract extension done. And if they do so, I think that speaks so much more to – what they think about the foot, right? Because if they extend Julio at age 30 for another four years or whatever, that tells you they're not overly concerned about the foot. And like you said, the injury happened years ago. He's dealt with it the last two years, played in all 32 games at a very elite level. So don't be concerned about Julio. Yeah, he's a genetic freak. He's like Adrian Peterson. That's yep. These guys just are just genetically gifted. As long as they're not stupid with their body, i.e. Leonard Fournette, you can allow it to be smart and you can have a great career. But if you're dumb about it and you let injuries take their over, then you're going to have a short career. I mean, he went 170 targets, 113 passes, 1,677 yards, and eight TDs. We forget that he didn't catch a TD until like week nine or something. He had a fantastic year, and he struggled with touchdowns at the beginning of the year. Right, and he was was dealing with the same foot stuff then as he is going to be now so if he did it then there's no reason to be concerned about him not being able to do it now so Julio Jones don't worry about it let's move on to this last part and I'm, I'm pretty excited to kind of talk about this this is more of a general strategy thing the question uh, originally was posted on Twitter it was something along the lines of like the top three worst injuries that players play through in the season or and or top three injuries that won't really affect players in the season so I kind of want to hand off the mic to you. Now, we don't have to go like top three, but let's talk about some injuries that we hear all the time in like fantasy football that you, you know, if someone on your team suffers this injury, like it's a, it's a red flag, probably not to play them as long as, you know, they're, you know, limited throughout practice or something, or ones that we hear a lot of um, that are thrown around a lot, but you shouldn't be overly concerned about. So are there any like glaring ones that, you know, maybe like keywords or buzzwords that we hear a lot throughout the season that we should be overly concerned about or not concerned about? Number one, I, 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 and for me, it's like one and then there's like a mile gap and then there's the rest. Hamstring. Just hamstrings. Knew it. Why? This was actually a test on my boards last week. Uh, the hamstring, any muscle that goes over two joints is prone to tearing. The hamstring is one of them. We have probably four hamstrings, but or four hamstring muscles, but there's a couple locations where we have a tendency to tear them. These guys don't run full force in the off season. They may train, but they're not running full force. And that's really when the hamstrings are getting activated, truly activated. The issue is that these guys start ramping up, but they don't do the proper lengthening 
exercises to prepare that muscle to be able to, to stretch and, and anticipate that much uh, velocity and, and strength, uh, stretch at that time. That's why so, we see so many early on in the correct. season. That's why we see them all in preseason and early four, six, five, six weeks after that. You never hear about them really ever. Uh, and that, like after like week, uh, week six or seven, they're like super rare. But the first like six, eight, uh, ten weeks starting in, in August, you, that's all you hear about. Oh, he has a hamstring. Oh, he has a hamstring. Well, um, the issue with hamstrings is that they don't heal well. They don't heal quickly. And if you don't properly – let them heal, they will re-injure. If you, if you have a four to, to six week timetable and the, all these guys think they're superhuman and they're going to recover faster because they're used to beating all the odds anyway. Yeah. The problem is these guidelines are made for them. They're not made for me and you. They're made for pro athletes. So right. these are, this is what it takes to get them back. This is why Leonard Fournette got re-injured because he tried to rush back too soon. Probably didn't really push it when he was asked to push it in practice. It was like, yeah, I feel pretty good. Got back into the game, tried to burst and hit a hole, and boom, back to square one, and you're back on the bench for another month because of that. Yep. Alan Cook, same thing. Um, this happens. So hamstring injuries, when you hear that word, they need to shut it down. Right. If you don't shut it down in a runner like a, 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 a running back or a, really most of the guys except for linemen, they're gonna they're notorious. They're gonna push and they're gonna cause some issues, and you're they're never they're never gonna be the same for another month or two. All right, so let me ask you. Let me ask you this. So you drafted your fantasy team, right? It's week one. One of your starting running backs pulls his hamstring. In your mind, you're like, fuck, the earliest I'm going to be able to put this guy back into my fantasy lineup, say this happens week one, you're probably thinking, like a lot of people would be like, oh, I hope he plays next week or I hope I get him back in my lineup by week three. In your mind, you're, you're preparing five. for what, like week five? Four or five, yeah. Depending on when their buy is, depending on their depth, depending on the severity of injury. Um, if I can, I'd probably try to flip them. I was going to say, I, I might even be that it. aggressive because at week six or whatever, your team's like pretty much set in stone and your league is pretty much, unless, you know, one of the, you're one of the few that's kind of in the thick of it. Your, 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 your assets are done. Like you, you, you know, you're, you're done. So if, if you have someone like, Oh, it's minor. And you can take advantage of, of, of someone saying, Oh, it may be just minor. Yeah. You know, try – remember when uh, Leonard Fredette was three or four weeks after his first uh, tear and yeah. then he came back, what his value was, and, and he re-injured again? Still up there, yeah. He was like waiver wire material practically. Like, he, he didn't have any value because no one trusted him. Yeah, but what happens is, like, they'll pull the hamstring, and then the first thing you'll see is, like, oh, he's day-to-day -day with a hamstring yeah. pull. So That's people what they like, always say. Exactly. So people will be like, oh, you know what? He'll be back in the lineup. So I'm about to get an RB1 in trade. So nope. if you can flip that guy, if you're hearing hype within the first few days of the hamstring pull and you know you're not going to be able to use him for three to four weeks, try to flip that guy. I like that strategy yeah. a lot because, you know, we hear all these ridiculous reports from people who have no idea what they're talking about when it comes to injuries. Yeah, like I will, I will give you an idea. I do weekly podcasts, as you know. I do weekly I, pretty much daily updates if I can, if I see the information. Mm -hmm. uh, and especially when I'm watching on Sunday, uh, if, if a hamstring injury comes up, you will read about it on my Twitter feed and you will know my thoughts on it pretty quickly. Right. NFL is not very fast and, 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 and they're updating and whatnot. Like baseball, I can tell you what the injury is, how long he'll be out and when he's having surgery within 24 hours of that injury. It's that fast. Yeah. It doesn't happen that way in the NFL. We don't know it. I, I mean, the, the staff knows it, but the lay people don't know it. So they, they, you can't make decisions based on just the information they're going to give you because they're not going to give you much. That's right. the problem. Okay. Yeah. So hamstring is obviously one for concern. You could probably yeah. flip a guy. Um, now, when it comes to like these types of injuries, because I mean, obviously everyone's dealt with someone on their team having a hamstring pull. Like say he's in that three to four week range, right? And you're hearing that he is back at practice. Do you have a rule? Like my, me personally, I like to make sure – that the guy has practiced in full mm -hmm. for at least three practices that week. If he's, you know, he didn't practice Wednesday, he didn't practice Thursday, he's limited Friday, limited Saturday, I'm like, mm -hmm. I don't want him in my lineup at all. But people yep. will be like, oh, he's playing, he's active, like I'm yeah. in my lineup. No, right? Yeah, I mean, it, a lot of it depends on how your team is structured. Is he your flex guy or is he your RB1? Like, right. do you have the luxury of putting your RB1 in a flex spot? 
or do you have to depend on him as your RB1? Like, I, I need a guy to practice at least two to three days. Um, ideally, I'd like to sit him that first week and make sure yeah. he does okay. Like, that's an ideal situation. You may not have that luxury, but that's ideally what you'd like. I want you to prove to me that that hamstring is ready. Yeah, I did uh, something. I, I looked back at last year's running backs group, and I looked at every running back that missed multiple weeks in a row. Um, whether it was in the, in the off season or if it was leading up to the season. And I looked at their numbers in the first game back from those multi-week injuries. So say they missed weeks two and three, what their numbers were in week four, or if guys missed four weeks at a time. And basically it was a sample size of, uh, I think about um, maybe 25 or 30 running backs. And in that case, the average production dip in all of those guys in that first week back was like 25% less touches, 25% less yardage, um, like 35% less receiving work. So if there's like a coaching staff that wants to pull back the work and the most, for the most part, it's in the receiving, right? So they, they want to use them as a rusher still, but overall it's like when you deal with these multi-week injuries, like you said, you kind of want to fade them if you can in that first week back because they're not getting the touches and their production is going to dip and they're at a high rate of, uh, of re-injuring that stuff. Yeah. I mean, and, and they're being, the training staff is being smart with them. Mm -hmm. logically they're not going to throw them to the wolves because what happens if you re-injury then you're out for another month or at least yeah so it's like they, you have to be smart if you have the luxury of taking a week off from this do it uh, in terms of uh, sitting or starting them on the event if you don't have it then just hope that he doesn't re-injure it i guess yeah all right so you brought up groin the mm -hmm. a groin pull i guess or a groin whatever yeah. groin strain yep groin strain uh, so this is similar Straight. to hamstring, similar Hamst timetable yep. and everything? So, uh, not quite as bad, but they can linger. Okay. Hamstrings and groins are notorious for lingering. The quads aren't too bad. Um, groin strains, they, uh, a lot of it has the same running motion. Uh, they're on basically opposite sides of the leg, but they contribute to a lot of the same movements. So moving your leg in and out, up and down, uh, all of that is indirectly groin muscles. If you strain a groin muscle, they hurt, man. You can't even lift your leg. And try running. It takes two, three, four weeks to really feel better. So a lot of the times, these guys will, they can return faster than a hamstring, but they're still not, they'll, they'll even admit, like they're not 100% for a good four to six weeks until, uh, until it really it starts to be back to normal. Some guys end up having to have uh, hernia surgery in the off season because uh, it never healed appropriately back onto the bone and it's kind of like scar tissue and it just doesn't feel right. I mean, I, I, I feel like I've personally pulled my groin multiple times and even when you get to a certain point, like a couple weeks out, you feel like the groin is a hundred percent, but like one slight wrong movement and you're like back to square one. So it's like, it, it feels like it never actually gets back to a hundred percent. Groin is just like a scary injury to deal with, especially yeah, if you know it someone because it's, it's involved in every movement and everything you do with your body. Yeah, uh, the the third one that I that 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 comes up a lot is is a meniscal injury that we talked about previously. These take a couple weeks to calm down. Like Joe Mixon uh, last year, right? Yeah, like uh, Joe Mixon, like uh, like uh, 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 Sony Michelle. There's a couple, probably a couple other guys that aren't popping into my head right now. Right. All of these guys suffered meniscal injuries. Mixon, I think I don't I didn't see the scope, but uh, had a little piece of cartilage that was either flow. Uh, partially torn off or something floating obviously he came back and had a hell of a season uh but it takes a couple of weeks to get him back so if they're they're going to be smart about it they're going to probably get an mri they'll see how big the piece is if there's anything else going on then likely they'll say all right we don't have the luxury of time right now let's scope it we'll get you back in three to four weeks um, as opposed to just give, giving a week off that's not going to change uh how large that tear is that's not going to change uh, that tear from being a tear to no tear. It's just, it's not, not going to happen. A lot of the times those guys get scoped. Yeah. So with the meniscal tear, it seems almost like those are, I don't want, I don't know if straightforward is the right word, but I haven't in my experience the last few years, a lot of these guys like Mixon, you said came back and performed well afterwards. Yeah. It doesn't really seem like these linger that much compared to the, you know, like the, the groin no. answering. Not, not, no, because groin and hamstring are soft tissue injuries. They're muscle injuries. The, uh, the meniscus is a, is a piece of cartilage. It doesn't, it doesn't work the same way. So once you surgically address it or, or rehab it, depending on what you're doing to it, most of the time they respond and you really don't have to worry about it until you okay. suffer a new injury to it. And then 
you kind of repeat the cycle. Gotcha. So not a big problem. Are there any other um, injuries that occur throughout the year that maybe are, are scary to see, but maybe not as concerning from a fantasy owner perspective? Yeah. Uh, I'll add one more a quick comment about the concerning injuries. Um, yeah. a, a turf toe that like AJ Green suffered, those linger. Uh, if they suffer a fifth uh, metatarsal fracture or Jones fracture, they're going to be done anyway. So you don't really have to worry about it lingering. Uh, a turf toe, they will linger. So you, you, as you saw with AJ Green, you, you have to be really careful with it. I knew he wasn't going to be able to perform right because of what he's asking his toe to do and how quickly it takes or doesn't heal. Um, in terms of injuries that don't, that, that I'm really not worried about, so to speak, the most common injury in sports, ankle sprain. Right. Um, are they concerning? Yeah, a little bit, but not really. Um, grade one is just when you roll your ankle, everybody's had a grade one ankle sprain. Uh, grade two, the issue with the ankle sprain is it doesn't heal well in anybody. It just, it's, it's a set of ligaments that just scar and they don't heal. So, uh, they have to really tape it up. They have to, uh, uh, where uh, use the appropriate uh, amount of what we call proprioceptive movement. So they're doing a lot of specific rehab to get that back. So it takes a couple of weeks uh, to really feel 100% again, but they usually can run on it. Uh, but it, they're just not the same. Just not, they're not quite 100%. Shoulder sprain, uh, not overly concerning unless you're a quarterback like Winston had a couple of years ago. Uh, hip pointers, they're hurt, uh, but they take like two weeks and then they're pretty good. Okay. If it's groin, like a, a hip, like more like a hip label tear that's what Doyle had um those are annoying and those take those those really don't do well that's kind of like tearing the labor in your shoulder it's the same thing but it's in your hip those usually require a scope and you can't you really can't get much better unless you'd scope it like they just don't they don't do well rehab wise I've, I've tried to rehab them well and they just they don't okay um now in terms of the ankle sprains it, it seems like you know, like you, there, these have to be taken into a really heavy context because there's different grades of them, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, so you're saying if, if it's like a grade one, it's a minor one. It's not something you necessarily have yeah. to be too concerned about playing a guy because he's probably going to get taped up and he'll be all right. It's just more like a pain yeah. tolerance thing. Yeah, pain tolerance, swelling. Um, they won't have the same type of reaction time that they want, that they expect from their ankle that, that, uh, because of that, but, but it'll be pretty okay. A grade two, they probably won't be able to play, uh, okay. quickly. Like they just, it'll be too swollen. They, it really, it even hurts to walk on it. I mean, if you can't walk on it, you definitely can't play on it. Um, so like those are the ones that take a couple weeks, mm -hmm. but if it's a grade one, uh, they usually tape it up. They'll, they'll wear a brace, which, uh, can, does have data to prevent, says it prevents injury, but it will not prevent severity so if it was supposed to be a grade two it's going to be a grade two if it was going to be a grade one man maybe you won't get one because you're wearing the brace okay cool. but um yeah but ankle ankle injuries are super common these guys roll their ankle all the time tripping over feet tripping over dirt or whatever uh themselves uh super common uh it just it happens but um uh, a lot of the time not overly concerning they can kind of walk it off it's the grade twos and grade threes of full terror they usually need surgery Grade twos is the kind of the gray area where like, eh, if they can't walk, if they're in a boot, if they're on crutches, they're probably not playing next week. Right. Um, you know, but those take a couple more weeks, at least a couple weeks. Basketball players take like a month um, to, to come back. Uh, different yeah, that makes sense because, I mean, they're running up and down the, the court all day. And, yeah. and jumping. Play. Yeah. yeah, jumping, exactly. All right, well, that was a ton of valuable information. That was a fantastic episode. Um, so, Dr. Jesse Morse, make sure you're following him on Twitter. His name's been – link down there below. Um, tell us, I know you guys have your YouTube channel up and running and have been doing that for a while. So if you're following them on YouTube, if you're following them on Twitter, you will get these up-to-date injury updates, you know, in context. So you know what to do with your players. Let them know um, a little bit more about the injury profiles and the, and the little draft guide that you guys have going on and, uh, you know, anywhere else that you would like them to find you. Yeah, so um, I'm Dr. Jesse Morse. I am uh, part of the Fantasy Doctors. We are a group of all uh, orthopedic trained physicians. Uh, we are all physicians in our group. There's one guy who uh, coordinates a lot of stuff, but uh, he doesn't put out content. So everything you read from us is written by a physician that is either taking care of it in the OR or taking care of it in an office. Uh, so uh, 
they're all quality content and it's the right timelines and it's applicable to the situation. We, uh, I, I'm in the middle of drafting a massive, huge uh, injury analysis a profile that we briefly discussed today that'll be over probably six, between 60 and 70 profiles um, it, when it's all said and done. Yeah, right now it's, it's on sale for $5 only. Um, uh, there's probably about 15 to 20 profiles available now. And, and in the next two weeks, they'll probably be the majority of the rest of them. Uh, that is available on the fantasy doctors.com or indirectly through uh, Nick's, uh, uh, the draft guide. guide. And, yeah. Big dog. Um, throughout the season, I will be doing videos. I'll be doing weekly uh, podcasts, uh, on, uh, we have uh, a couple different ones we do. I have one that's called injuries One Hundred and One that is a kind of specific players. And then we have the fantasy doctors podcast. That is uh, kind of all the injuries that happened that play that week. Um, and then I have my own YouTube channel that I do like personal lectures and stuff. There's a, a cool one on shoulder injuries uh, that I did about a month ago. If you guys want to check it out. Great. All right. Well, I will link all that stuff down below. Make sure you go follow all that stuff after the video. If you enjoyed the video, make sure you hit that thumbs up button, subscribe to the channel. If you are new, and we will see you on tomorrow's video. And hopefully we'll have Dr. Morris back on the channel before the uh, season kicks off. And again, he will be coming back on during the season weekly. So you'll get tons of good uh, information and valuable content during the season. So uh, that is it for today. And we'll see you all later. Peace. Peace. Thank you.